Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. Now, on behalf of Mark and Alice and myself, we want to greet you in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. As we continue on uh, in a section of our study that we started a few weeks ago, looking, searching for Christianity in our own lives. Mm -hmm. So we're looking for the evidence of a redeemed life. And we've determined that the evidence of a redeemed life is, as Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. You'll know them by their fruit. So last week we talked about, well, we've talked about love and we've talked about joy. So in this program we're going to talk about peace. Hallelujah. That peace like a river. Peace like a river. So we're going to do that. But before we do that, I'm going to ask Brother Mark if you'll ask God's blessing on our time together. Thank you, Lord. Well, Lord, I just <clears throat> thank you for the opportunity to be here again with brothers and sisters in Christ. And Lord, just let us see in your word where we can love you and get the whole, the fruit of the Spirit from, from you to, to shine forth to others around the world and wherever we meet them on a day-to-day -day basis. And just reveal your word to us more and more every day. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Okay, as I said, we, we, we've looked at love and we've looked at joy. And the next one is Peace. the fruit of the Spirit. And this is in Galatians chapter 5, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Um, so, as I said last week, we talked about joy. Joy that's unshakable. That's not connected to circumstance, but connected to, to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that's a joy that leads to peace. A peace that the world can't give. Isn't that what Jesus said? Right. He said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give you. So do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. That's John 14, 27. Peace that passes all understanding. And the peace of God, Paul wrote to the Philippians, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Well, that's what we need today. We need to have a guard over our hearts and our minds in these perilous last days. So peace that is the fruit of the Holy Spirit, and it is truly the evidence of a redeemed life, is what we're talking about, okay? If you're going to talk about peace, and we are going to talk about peace, you know where it really should start is in Colossians, Paul's letter to the Colossians, he talks about the fact that God the Father reconciled us to him, having made peace through the blood of his son, Jesus Christ, on the cross. Do right. you understand that while we were yet sinners, we were, we were enemies of God? Yes. Sin, sin makes you an enemy of God. Well, you know, it talks about the cup of wrath in the book of Revelation. And, and, uh, and Jesus drank the whole cup. So that's how he made peace by taking all of God's anger and putting it on him. Well, yeah, for those who will receive it. Yes. Um, Paul, that's what Paul says in Romans. He talks about the fact that we have been saved. You know, what have been saved from? The uh, wrath of God. God. From the wrath of God. That's what Paul says in Romans. A lot of people think that it's all about just being saved from, from uh, being overweight and being, you know, not having enough money. No, it's being saved from the wrath of God. Right. But it's about having, ha being at peace with God. That's what it's all about. Salvation is nothing more than being reconciled, being at peace with God the Father through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Or realizing that God is at peace with us through his rage, his wrath is taken care of. Well, hmm. I got to think about that one. Yeah, I know. I, <laughs> I mean, God was never seeking an opportunity. It was never his desire because it says, you know, Peter wrote in his third letter, in his second letter in the third chapter, that his desire is that none should perish, but all right. come to everlasting life. And his, the promise of the Lord, ever since Adam sinned and fell in the garden, what God has been revealing through the word, and it's revealed from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22, is his plan for salvation. But that has got to be based on, it's, it's, motiva it's motivated by his love for us, but it's got to be just. Well, Mark, it is just. It's, it is just. Yes, it is just, because the price has been paid. Right. Okay. Uh, justice requires, well, it says the wage, wages of sin is death. Mm -hmm. Where there is sin, there has to be death. Right. 
you know, his grace doesn't, his grace does not override his word. Okay? Yes. God watches over his word to perform it. So the price for our sins was paid in the death of Jesus Christ. But the issue is being at peace with God. Okay? We were enemies of God. And now he calls us his friends. Peace, if you're not at peace with God, I'm going to tell you something. You'll never be at peace with anybody. No. Husbands, you'll never be at peace with your wife. You'll never be at peace with your children. Wives, you'll never be at peace with your husband. You'll never, you'll never have peace in your life until you have been reconciled to God the Father and have peace with him through the work of Jesus Christ. And that's the purpose well, of Jesus dying on the cross, to reconcile yes. All right. to, God, to God. And you see, one of the things I talked about last week was the fact there's a continuity. There's a connection between all of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. You know, it's like, it's like a chain link. Love, as we talked about in the first and second uh, parts of the program, lead to joy. And the joy leads to peace. Okay, they're connected. They, they are absolutely connected. Think about this verse from Isaiah. Now, this is, this is 750 years before the birth of Christ. God spoke through the prophet Isaiah and said, For you will go out with joy and be led forth with peace. Those are two connected things. The joy and the peace are connected. But you have to be clear about something. You absolutely have to be clear about something. There is only one source for true, lasting peace. The Lord Jesus Christ. The Prince of Peace. No Jesus, no peace. Mm -hmm. I've seen bumper stickers, no justice, no peace. Well, I'm going to tell you something. Mm -hmm. The world's idea of justice will never bring peace. No. Only thing that will bring peace is Jesus Christ. He is the Prince of Peace. That's, that's what, this is what the prophecy was through Isaiah when it talked about a virgin giving birth. Mm -hmm. right? That Jesus, a, a child would be born to us. He would be the Prince of Peace. And Paul says in, the, in his letter to the Ephesians, it, talking about Jesus, he himself is our peace. So let's just think about this again, right? Mm -hmm. Jesus said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you, right? Mm -hmm. So that's what Jesus said. So that makes it pretty evident then. <laughs> It makes it clear that he, Jesus, and the world have very different ideas of what peace actually is. The United Nations was formed, well, you can go back to the end of the First World War when Woodrow Wilson had you know, a, a concept for, the, for, for a, a world organization to bring peace, it was League of Nations. Well, then you had the Second World War. I mean, that shows you how well that worked out. How well the, the world has been searching for peace since Cain and Abel? I mean... I was going to say, don't you think that the world thinks peace is when it's without war? Without conflict. Without conflict. Without conflict. Then there's... They, they the world it. believes that peace is all about the absence of conflict. Right. So, so how's that worked out? No. Well, let me, let me just take a look at my own lifetime, right? I was born in 1943, in the midst of the Second World War, mm -hmm. right? Uh, an incredible war where millions of people died fighting around the world. Then, not long after I started school, America became embroiled in the horror of the Korean conflict. The Korean War is what it was. Mm -hmm. A war that is still not resolved more than 65 years later. Mm -hmm. I mean. The news, turn on the news, you're going to see about North Korea. That, that hasn't ended after 65 years. It's still an issue. I was raised with constant reminders of the Cold War. Mm -hmm. Okay? Now, many of you may be too young to really understand what the Cold War was, because it wasn't too cold at the time. This was a conflict with, with Russia that threatened nuclear holocaust at any moment. We, when I was a kid in school, I mean, they, they, every city in America, they tested the air raid sirens every week. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I had to practice don't, diving under my little wooden school desk, which would protect me from atomic assault, uh, apparently. Those are the magic, <laughs> magic wooden desk, desks. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. 
I, I went into the U.S. Navy, right? I went into to fly and had only been in one month when the Cuban Missile Crisis broke out, mm -hmm. came to pass. And if you know anything about history, that was probably the single closest moment in the reign of Castro and Kennedy that we were, and don't forget Khrushchev, mm -hmm. where we were literally, I mean, that far away from all-out nuclear war. Later, I was flying as part of a, a crew, flying border patrols up in the north around Russia, watching for the launch of missiles at any time, tracking their submarines, when we received an alert that there had been an attack in the Gulf of Tonkin that was the beginning of the Vietnam War, where how many 55,000 Americans died in that war, and untold numbers of Vietnamese people, right? And then I watched, uh, along with other Americans, as the American embassy in Tehran, Iran was taken over, right? Hostages. And, and the embassy staff was taken hostage for 444 days. Then, of course, there was the first Persian War, the Gulf War, right? Mm -hmm. Under George Bush the first, right? Senior. Senior. That was in 1991. And that was followed by the second attack on the World Trade Center. The first one was unsuccessful. And obviously, the second one in 2001 was yes. not unsuccessful. And that led to enduring freedom war in Afghanistan, right? Mm -hmm. Back in 2001. Still conflict, conflict in Afghanistan. Right. And then came the Iraq War, which continues to this day. My 74th year starting on, on this planet. And the war is still there. The conflict is still all around me. And none of that takes into account all of the other significant conflicts around the world during that time. In Israel, Northern Ireland, the Fox Falklands, Bosnia, um, in, in the Ukraine. And, and we you know we spend time in Africa. The three of us have been to Africa and ministering. There's constant conflict in countries, different countries in Africa. But it's not generally the bullets being shot halfway around the world that challenges our own personal peace day by day. So then, on a far more personal basis, there was the infamous 1977 Hudson River War in New York, which you may not have heard of. No. Yeah, I know you never heard of it. But that war died in its infancy, see? It was unable to overcome peace. Because that was a period of time when I was going to a seminary in, in New York, doing graduate work in a seminary in, in New York, right outside New York City. And while I was doing that, I took a part-time job working in a boatyard mm -hmm. on the Hudson River. And the fellow there, and, and he was an old Italian fellow, and for whatever reason, and I know the reason, he took an instant dislike to me. But it, was, it really was about my relationship with the Lord. So obviously he was having issues with the Lord, mm -hmm. and he kind of took it out on me because I represented what he <coughs> saw as religion. So when I work, went to work there, now remember, I had been, before, just, just shortly before that, I, when, I, when I got saved, I was the president of an advertising agency in New York. I had held management and executive jobs in New York for, for many, many years, right? And now all of a sudden I'm doing manual work, very, very manual work, here in this boatyard on the Hudson River. And this fella, if, if there was a dirty job to be done, he came straight to me and he gave me, he gave me every single rotten, dirty job that was, and believe me, in a boatyard like that, there are plenty of dirty, rotten jobs. So he gave me everyone and he treated me so nasty. I mean, it was just, he really took it dislike, but I know that it wasn't me personally that he, that he disliked. There was something in his spirit that was just reacting to, to my relationship with Jesus Christ. So... One day, uh, uh, this was a boatyard where you know people owned private boats, and a group of boat owners, I think there were three or four <coughs> boat owners, they came to me and they said to me, they took me aside, and they said, why don't you just punch this guy in the nose and be done with it? I mean, literally, that's what they said to me. Why don't you just go punch him out and be done with it? And I said, well, I explained to him why I didn't. And the reason I didn't was because I had the love of God in my heart. I had the joy in my life, and I had a peace that passes understanding. Not a peace that the world gives, but I had a peace that God gave me. 
So I would just, every time he'd tell me to do some dirty job, I'd just say, okay, yes, sir, and I'd go do it. And I would do it as unto the Lord. And you took no offense. And I took no offense, right? One of the things, um, I, I don't know, do you plan to get to James chapter 4, verse 1 well, through 5? Well, I, I can't tell you what I'm going to get to at all. Okay. All right. Wait, wait. Let me just finish this story, okay. right? Because what, what happened was, when I had the chance, when I had the opportunity to share that fact with these guys, a couple of them got saved that day, right there in that boatyard. Now, it wasn't because of me. It was because of the evidence of the life of Jesus Christ in me. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. And that should be the, the witness of our lives is the presence of God in our lives, the fact that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We bear, we carry the love of God. We carry the joy of the Spirit. We carry the peace that only the Lord can give. And you want to know something? After I, after I read all these things about my life, don't you think that the world is hungry for peace? Absolutely. They're constantly, constantly searching for peace mm -hmm. and never, ever able to obtain it. And you want to know something? They never will. No, no Jesus no peace. No Jesus, no peace. They're trying to accomplish peace on their own terms and their own understanding, leaning on their own understanding of it. Well, and it's an only, only a temporary peace at best. No, it's, I, you see, I, I don't even like that word. You know, I mentioned uh, North Korea, the Korean conflict. And I said, that's, that's not over. Here, 65 years later, it's still not over. But the fact of the matter is... There's still tension there. No, it's still, there's still conflict. Conflict is a word. I mean, there's, there's it still is conflict, but that's because the world never has peace. No, it never does. There's a difference between a ceasefire, yes, and peace. Can I read you something? Yeah, but let me just finish okay. that thought, right? Because a ceasefire is generally time just to reload mm -hmm. or swap enemies around. Go ahead. Mark. Okay, in James four verse one through about five. It says, what is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is it not the source of your pleasures that wage war in your members? You lust and do not have, so you commit mur murder. And you are envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. You adulterers, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scriptures speak to no purpose? He jealously desires the spirit which has made to dwell in us. The whole thing is, if you try to do it on your own, if, if you have peace between nations and don't have peace between na neighbors, it's a moon it's a well, moon point. It goes that, back to that's what I've been saying. Peace I mean, with it, God. It you goes know? back to peace yeah. with God. That's what that says yeah. is is basically you, you you've made yourself an enemy of God. Right. Well if you love the world, you have not the love of the Father within you. But it says you do not have because so you commit mur murder. That's what war is. That's it's all en envious. You see something that somebody else has, and you take it by violence. Well, do you think that's going to get better? No. That's the whole point. The, 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 the whole point is, Paul says in his letter to Timothy, second letter to Timothy, chapter 3, he talks about the perilous last days, and he says in the last days, men will be lovers of self, right. lovers of money. They're gonna, it's going to get worse and worse, because the things that lead to conflict... The things that you just read, that James wrote about, the things that lead to conflict are going to grow. They're going to get worse and worse. And it says in Revelation, in the book of Revelation, in chapter 9, it talks about the fact that in the last days, in those last days, men will not repent of their murders. They're not going to repent of their drugs. They're not going to repent of their pornography. They're not going to repent of their murders. They're not going to repent of their theft. Taking what they want by theft. Thievery is taken by force. I mean, that's... So this conflict is going to go on. We can't, I, my job is not to change the world. And no. Your job is not to change the world. Jesus didn't even pray for the world when he went into the garden the night that he was taken. But it's about praying for those the Father gave him. It's about trying to be reconciled one person. Because it's about whosoever receives us. Right. Whoever will, re that's what John 3.16 is all about. 
God's the Father. He, he looked. This is what I see. God before, before we were saved, before we, while we were yet sinners. This is how we know what love is. While we were yet sinners, He loved us to, enough to give His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, in our place, so that there would be justice, and that's the expression of mercy coupled with justice. But it says that gift is there for whosoever will receive it. And that goes back to hearing his voice. you got to hear his voice, and then you have to accept his gift. And his gift, listen, the first thing you get is the love of God. Amen. When you get the love of God, I promise you, it'll turn that joy switch on. There's nothing that will give you joy like the love of God. And that leads to peace, all right? But the reason that I responded the way I did with that guy in the boatyard was... Sermon on the Mount. Yeah. Think about the teaching. Remember, this is the epitome of training in righteousness. Jesus teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. And he said, from the Gospel of Matthew 5 and 6 and 7, mm -hmm. Blessed are the gentle. Blessed are those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness. Blessed are you when people insult and persecute you because of me. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Do not resist an evil person. But whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. If you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Love, this is the word of God. This is the word of Jesus Christ, the teaching. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. So it wasn't me. That's God's love in me. And the unshakable joy that he has given me, along with the perfect peace. I had that in the midst of all of that. That was the evidence, not of what a good guy I was. That's an, the evidence of his work in me. He's working his will and his pleasure in my life. As he desires to do in all of our lives, right? That led a couple of those guys to be saved that very day. So, remember the verse we started with right, in the chapter, Unlike the world, Jesus taught that true peace is calm and confidence in the midst of conflict. It's not the absence of conflict, but it's having that peace in the midst of conflict. And I think when you're in a conflict or in any circumstance where you shouldn't have peace, where the, you know, it, it would by just worldly be, standards, right, by yeah. worldly standards, you know, you mean you absolutely know this is peace that God is giving me. Not as the world gives. Exactly. Because the world doesn't give you that kind no, of peace. No, It passes understanding. When you can stand there and there's no visible reason for you to have peace, everything's going wrong around you, and yet you have, you have peace. peace. You it, know it. You just know it. It doesn't have to have under... It passes. It surpasses yeah, understanding, yeah. right? So, so think about these circumstances, right? You know when Jesus was going across the Sea of Galilee with his disciples and he said, we're, we're going to get in the boat, we're going to go to the other side, right? And a great storm arose as they were crossing, and the apostles woke the calm and sleeping Prince of Peace. Right? That's right. In the middle of the storm, these, these guys, some of these guys are fishermen who have grown up and lived on the Sea of Galilee. This is not the first time they saw a stormy Absolutely weather. Absolutely not. So it had to be a pretty bad one. And Jesus is sound asleep. At peace. So the apostles said to him, Don't you care that we're perishing? That's prayer, by the way. Yes, it is. That's a very bad prayer. Well, conversation with Jesus, that's prayer, the way I see it, right? And that's what they're, Don't you care we're perishing? So it says in Mark 4 39, Then he arose and he rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased. And there was a great calm. So after rebuking the storm, he continued to rebuke the disciples for their lack of faith. They were looking to Jesus for their solution without looking at Jesus and learning. They weren't inspired by his peace, nor motivated to Im imitate it. Right? Yeah. I mean, it's, think about that. I mean, that's really important that we have to see Fixing your eyes on Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of your faith. You've got to see him and his life 
as the perfect example of our lives. Well, because of the fact that they were focused on the situation, that fear came in. So that, that's why there was no faith. Okay, I want to, I'm, we're going to run out of time here. And I want, to, I want to end on a really, really important point, okay? This is absolutely, write this down. <laughs> okay. The English word peace comes from the Latin word pacem, mm -hmm. pax, okay? Yes. Now that word is rooted in the word for pact, okay. a pact. Mm -hmm. A pact is an agreement or a covenant between two parties. Right. Peace comes from a covenant between two parties. We need to remember, as those disciples apparently had not, that Jesus had told them that they were going to go to the other Sorry. side. When Jesus speaks something, he has made a pact with us. Mm -hmm. Every word of God, he watches over his word to perform it. All of his words are a covenant with us. Mm -hmm. All right, and no promise that he has promised has failed to come to pass, okay? So, listen, this is what Jesus said. Mm -hmm. Listen, these things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. John 16, 33. Mm -hmm. The Lord said to all who will come to him, incline your ear and come to me. Listen that you may live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you according to the faithful mercy shown to David. Isaiah 55, 3. So continuing in that same chapter of Isaiah 55, right, where God proclaims that his word never fails, that it always accomplishes his purpose, right? He says, for you will go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills will break forth into shouts of joy before you, and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Isaiah 55, 12. <clears throat> I hope that the bells are sounding and the lights are flashing in your head. The Father, because of his love, sent his word, the word made flesh, into the world for whosoever believes. And the result of that redeeming gift of love is joy, and the result of that joy is peace to whoever believes. Remember what I just said a minute ago. And it's from 1 Kings 8.56. Not one word has failed of all his good promises, which he promised. So I, we looked at the storm at the Sea of Galilee. I, I, I don't have time to do this now. But when we start next week, I want to talk about another storm and show you an example of perfect peace mm -hmm. in probably one of the most imperfect situations you can imagine. Amen. Okay? Your peace, like your joy, is totally not connected to your situation. Or your circumstance. It is about being connected to the Lord God Almighty. Amen. And Amen. Father, we just thank you that you yes. sent your Son thank you, to Jesus. reconcile us, yeah. to repair us to you, mm. to bring us back into that right relationship with you, Lord God, that the fruit of the Spirit might burst forth in our life, that we would walk in the power of your love, Lord God. Thank you, Jesus. And we would be shining forth, bringing the knowledge of your presence into every place we go. We thank you that you can use us like that, Father. Well, until next program, but as time flies by. Yes, it does. We're looking forward to seeing you again. God bless you and goodbye. So I cherish that old rugged cross Till my trophy I lay down I will cling to that old rugged cross and exchange